We're looking to have a great discussion here with you, everyone. But I want to first acknowledge the land acknowledgement will appear in your chat, the moderator uh, guide, as well as code of conduct of how to interact will also be placed into the chat. I want to thank my colleagues for joining me over the next 50 minutes, but you should know that this will be recorded for later viewing, and we will be taking questions both in the chat and at the end of the session as well. There will be places for all of you in the audience to participate in a poll. So as I like to say in my day job, class participation is 10% of your grades. So let me just say a few remarks before I ask my, my uh, uh, fine colleagues to introduce themselves. We're talking about HTEC today. We're talking about HTEC in the pandemic. But I also want to talk about HTEC broadly in the whole spirit of the, of the event here. We're no longer talking about technology in service of what we call old age which typically in our mind, whether we like it or not, has a storyline in the back that it's a short period of frailty, illness, disability. Not incorrect altogether, but woefully incomplete. In fact, what we are finding is that increasingly this thing we call old age is actually one third of adult life. We can do the math on that later on, but start thinking about it. It is no longer a short trip to Disney, some wandering with grandchildren, maybe even a bored about of norovirus on a cruise. No, this is an entire frame time of life that we need to invent stories, ritual, and yes, technology. But my framing for today's discussion in part is I want everyone to think about the fact that something that many of us don't like to admit, old age is made up. Yes, indeed, that is my thesis. And what I mean by that is if you think about it, the whole idea of old age was created in the UK in the 1800s and came to North America in the 1900s and still sticks around so strongly, you don't even question it. You see, we, the medical science at the time said we were all born or imbued with a certain amount of vital force, vital energy. And if you used it badly, which by the way meant anything fun in addition to work, you would no longer be a glass half full, you'd be a glass half empty that you become so tired you couldn't work. And then you would have to, and think about this, stories create language and institutions behind them. You would be so tired you'd have to what? You would have to retire. The bottom line is a story of old age looks at aging as a problem to be solved rather than an opportunity or a success to celebrate. My panel and I today wanna to talk to you about age tech in the context of COVID, but a larger discussion of what aging and technology can be. We do not need more devices that are big, beige, and boring. There's more to life than simply checking your medications and your blood pressure. So on that note, I want everyone to think about the fact that we now need to think about technology and aging, whether we call it age tech or anything else, as a way of inventing life tomorrow not simply, shall we say, that is something about older adults in general. On that note, I have a great pleasure. I want to introduce my panel and I want them to uh, tell us a little bit about themselves. First up is Sarah Agvami, Director of Best Buy Health, then Hannah Marston, a co former colleague and, and friend of mine, research fellow of the Open University, and Andrew Sixsmith from the Associ Associate Scientific Director of AgeWell. Sarah, would you like to please introduce yourself and Hannah and Andrew, and then we'll get into round one. Thank you so much, everyone. An honor being here today. So I am Sarah Gwami, Director of Best Buy Health and Best Buy Canada. Um, our mission is to enrich lives through technology, and we're going to talk a little bit more about that later today. Hannah. Thanks, Joe, and welcome everybody. And it's great to be here as well. Um, my name is Hannah Marston. I'm a research fellow at the Open University based in the UK. Um, I've had the pleasure to work out in Canada with, um, with colleagues who I'm sure are attending today. And um, some of my areas of expertise are digital technologies, practices of marginalized communities and video games. Andrew. Uh, thanks, Joe. Uh, I'm Andrew Sixsmith. I'm Associate Scientific Director of AgeWell. Um, AgeWell, as you people probably know, is Canada's age tech network, and our, our mission is really to seize the opportunities uh, for using technology to improve the 
uh, quality of life and the health and independence of older people. I'm also a professor of gerontology at Simon Fraser University and director of the science and technology for aging research at Simon Fraser University as well. It's a pleasure Great. to be here. Great, Andrew. And I uh, would be remiss because I've already gotten uh, pinged on my own uh, text messaging here that I'm not acknowledging my cousins who I've done work with at Queen's University, University of Toronto, and yes, Simon Fraser and UBC, and there's a few schools in between, but quite literally uh, family cousins that just gave me a hard time for not saying hi to everybody. So the first question, this first round is setting the context of what we've all been putting up with for a year and a half, which is sounding like two years lost is what has the pandemic meant for age tech? Has it shed new light or new meaning or frankly new demands as to how we're thinking about technology? And work that's been done so well by, by AgeWell and, and my own team here at the MIT Age Lab, uh, we like to say uh, somewhat provocatively that technology has become the new toilet paper. That in fact, we've seen technology in many ways be accelerated into people's homes far faster than we expected before. In fact, in March, when we saw all of you, and we know who you are, buying toilet paper by the pallet load, people were going out there buying smart speakers and tablets and doorknobs that watch who comes to the door. So I'm going to throw out the first question. First one of you, please jump in. What has the pandemic taught us about age tech, and what does it mean for us going forward? I can start on that. We actually didn't have a genre for age tech, to be honest. So when the pandemic did hit and everybody were in the lineups of toilet papers, we also had a lineups of life solution needs. So very quickly we were asked about tablets for mom and dad, about uh, webcams can be stuck on top of the TV so they can take part in a birthday event, uh, whatever case may be uh, for them, or even data enabled devices because mom and dad do not have internet. Mm -hmm. um, so very quickly, we had to create our own genre of what that meant for, you know, for us to start carrying age tech solutions. But the, the greatest thing for us, uh, the opportunity for us to learn what life solutions, how life solutions can convert into technology needs. And so the future we're being told was, you know, kind of unveiling in front of our eyes through media and, and social. And we had to act really quickly and fast. So um, qu quite fun times, yet challenging for all of us, I'm sure. Yeah. And before anyone else chimes in, I want everyone to be chatting in the chat room. We want to hear from the audience as well. Hannah, it looks like you were reaching for the mic, please. Thanks, Joe. Yeah, I want to um, just bring in, you know, the pandemic has highlighted the inequalities across our um, communities and, and on the larger scale of, uh, you know, countries and, and different uh, societal impacts. Um, you know, we're aware that families with, with children or even just one child do not necessarily have the equipment to do homeschooling, to access homework and to submit. While, you know, from an academic standpoint, many of us read papers and, and books about telehealth and a lot of those services accessing one's doctor or a consultant in a hospital, a lot of that has also been um, started through, through online services like Zoom or, or even internal platforms. Very good. Andrew. Uh, thanks, Joe. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to start by saying probably the most obvious statement anybody could possibly make that the pandemic has been a disruptive force for us all. And we, we've, we should use that word disruptive um, in its correct way that it has forced us to um, address a, 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 the world in a different way. Um, the pandemic has been very negative, but um, I think it has kind of twisted our arms to look at new solutions to some of the old problems that you were um, you, you were alluding to uh, at the start, Joe, um, that, uh, okay, we're not going to be able to interact with each other as we had been doing. So we really got to figure out new ways of, of doing this. And I think um, the in, in a kind of a way, well, in a very definite way, we've been uh, we, we've been very lucky that we've 
had some of the communica information communication technologies that have allowed us to um, interact in a, in a virtual way that um, just a few years ago, we wouldn't have been able to do. So in a kind of a way, um, technology has, has really allowed us to, uh, to participate um, in work, in social uh, activities, etc., which we could not have done just a few years ago. Um, so I really think that that, that disruption is important. Um, yeah. So, uh, and we've seen definitely uh, older adults taking on technology that, as you say, that, that, the, um, that this disruption has really kind of forced our hands and people have been taking up technology-based solutions to, uh, to interact with each other. So Andrew, I, there's a point that, Hannah, that Sarah began and Hannah reinforced, I want to come back to, which around inequities and, and, and some access questions. But Andrew, you uh, age well, and I, I have to really take my hat off to the, all the work that age well does, not just in terms of agenda setting, but substantively find research that is moving uh, innovation forward into lives of people, uh, older and caregivers alike. You did some research, or, or age well did some polling in 2020 um, any data there you might be able to share that kind of is a highlight of, uh, that gives us a sense of how the technology has done, particularly in Canada? Uh, yeah, just some very uh, quick highlights on that. Um, not surprisingly, when we uh, did our survey uh, last year in, uh, in Canada, um, people were reporting that um, they were feeling more socially isolated, hardly surprising in the uh, middle of a pandemic. Uh, but we saw very significant um, positive responses about the, the use of technology to address the issues of uh, social isolation, uh, helping people to connect each other. Um, we've also seen a lot of um, community organizations stepping up to the plate, so to speak, to help those people. And this is referring back to what Hannah mentioned about some of the inequalities that exist for those people who have um, more difficulty in using technology or don't have access, um, how community organizations can help to support people who may not be able to, uh, to get access or use technologies. You know, one of the obvious things about accessibility, I want to go back to Sarah uh, mentioned in, a, in her opening remarks, was about access. And I certainly know that I've got family outside of Kingston and Cornwall in that area that, uh, you know, access is not just about having the technology and even having broadband. It's the speed of the broadband that matters as well. And if they don't have the speed, who cares about the device or the fact that you might have access for a very slow Netflix show? But there's another access that, Sarah, you mentioned in our prep call, and I, I want to attack as well, uh, that Andrew kind of gave me a segue to, which is access of knowing that these technologies exist. You know, information has its costs. And, and I guess one of the things I, I'd like to throw at you and, and Hannah and, and Andrew is, you know, all of us in the business know that this great thing called HTEC exists. I'm not entirely sure that uh, the rest of the marketplace does. Sarah, any thoughts? Yeah, I, I mean, for sure. So, I, mean, I think some of the challenge areas that were quickly opening up for us, you know, quick learning beyond the fact that internet is not available across Canada and not at the right speed. And if it is, it's not affordable. That's the reality of Canada. Um, digital literacy came about pretty quickly as well. So it's one thing to be able to pick up the technology off the shelf, gift it to mom and dad or hand-me-downs per se, but help them use it and be able to fish on their own was, was a massive um, area of opportunity we found to be the case. And there was no consistent or standard you know, uh, process across Canada for older adults or age tech level grade of digital literacy. So we quickly had to come up with the small academia of, oh my God, come, I'll show you slow pace and how, what pinch means on iPad, for example. Um, and, and, and that very quickly turned into the next area of challenge, which was um, who to call if it gets stuck. I mean, folks in long-term care were pulling the poor nurses from around the corner and like, come help me with this. And this is not their core competency, of course. So also very quickly we learned, you know, technical support was very important for adoption and retention of technology. It's great, we taught you. How can you go on on your own? And, and the last one I will say, and, and I'll pass it on to the next 
uh, panelists is um, too many standalone solutions were all by a sudden taken off the shelf. So lack of ecosystem, which also you know taught us how to be smarter about offering solutions to our to our end users also you know uh, opened our, our eyes where too many standalone solutions may not operate on one ecosystem this is why you know technology could get frustrating and confusing you know we take responsibility for part of that yeah. i would say one great compliment i have to give the best buy and others is that you're finally putting technology not just for entertainment purposes, but technologies that do other things mainstreaming in our lives. If I have to go to a special site to buy something that's in clinical blue, that's only about my blood pressure, guess what? I'm going to want somebody to reimburse it and have them install it and not want any part of it. We need to make this mainstream. Hannah, any thoughts? Yeah, thanks, Joe. Um, I agree with what Andrew and Sarah have already said. And I think what's also important is we haven't touched on the day-to-day -day activities, what occurred during the pandemic, the online shopping, the grocery shopping. You know, I touched on about homeschooling, but for many of us who maybe were, were shielding, loved ones, friends weren't able to come into our homes, you know, we, we still had to order our groceries and just those basic digital skills, having the confidence to input your your credit card, your, your debit card details online, you know, it, <clears throat> for many people that may have been a new, a new experience and, and it's down to trust. Can they trust this particular site? What's going to happen to their data? And we don't hear, I mean, we do hear depending on the disciplines, but, you know, it, it's a conversation that needs to continue to go going forward um, into a post pandemic society. And regarding um, the infrastructure of the internet in Canada, you know, the UK is the same as well. People, you know, in urban environments, close to cities, may not necessarily have high speed um, internet access, as well as those in rural communities as well. And that too impacts, you know, especially if you're waiting on online deliveries, or you've got a, a consultation meeting with, with a health practitioner. Um, and, you know, we need to have not only grassroots engagement, as well as, you know, regional and at national level. Right. I, I, indeed, I think that we can all agree that uh, fast broadband, speedy broadband, if you will, is the new water uh, and, and that the access to the house is very important. So look, the, the folks that are in our audience just want you to know there is no free lunch. We are going to have a poll come up. And so I'm going to ask my colleagues to launch that. Which role best describes all of you so that who we know who's out there in the audience? I think we've got a lot of folks speaking and I'd like to hear from you. I'm also watching in the chat of great success stories of 93-year-old uh, loved ones that are using computers seamlessly and the like. Uh, indeed, given the speed of technology, I think we're also seeing that uh, our, our youngest Gen Zers and millennials are aging fast because just when you think you learn one technology, uh, there's a new app that comes out or a new way of swiping or or voice and the like. So I'm looking here and I'm watching the, uh, the the bar chart change, asking my colleagues, I'm assuming you can see that as well. Looks like we've got uh, a fair number of older adults, caregivers. I guess one of the things we need to think about as well is that age tech, as we're referring to it in this panel, has very large stakeholder groups. It's not just about industry and researchers and, and formal care providers, but the stakeholder community has got to be the aging services community, retailers, researchers, caregivers. Uh, and we're going to come back to whether we should be calling this age tech later in, in, the, uh, in the session. I was wondering, can anyone else uh, want to touch on national differences before we, we move on to, to round two? So, Joe, I, ju I just want to um, answer a question that's come up in the Q&A box yeah. uh, by one of our attendees, Tatiana. And, you know, healthcare professionals or health and social care, and this also stems to those at consultancy level and in hospitals and, and our practice uh, doctors. But, you know, they too need to learn how to use technology, how to use platforms. Um, uh, you know, we read about telemedicine, telehealth delivery. If, you know, technology isn't necessarily, a, you know, a one size fits all. And if people in the community are going to 
be comfortable and confident to take up technology to facilitate um, independent living and and give an extra layer of care and support then those in the professions also need to learn. Absolutely. I, I think there is a misunderstanding or an assumption that we should all challenge. And, and Andrew, you can certainly comment on this, is I don't believe that technology ever, ever helps you do what you do better. I think that's, uh, shall we say, going tech on the cheap. If we were using our computers the way, we, I'm going to show my age now, uh, the way we used to use selectric typewriters, we would not be optimizing, shall we say, the technology. And so whether you're a social worker, a physician, a nurse, or, or the like, if you look into the curricula that these professionals are coming out on, even the recently graduated, they're not being taught on the technology. They still believe that if I'm a doctor, if I'm a nurse, I must touch my patient to provide care, that this thing called telehealth, telemedicine is it's something extra, or it's in lieu of, I don't have high touch, so therefore I use high tech. So Andrew, in your experience, uh, how do we get the knowledge of these technologies and making them part of the professions out there both from your yeah. age well perspective and professor uh, role? Uh, yeah, that, that's you've raised a good point there, is that those people who we would expect to give us the sort of the, the, the answers and the support and the help often, often are uh, challenged technology, uh, technologically themselves. I actually did a project maybe 20 years ago, which was exactly on this topic about occupational therapists and their understanding of the kind of emerging age tech market as, the, as it was then. And really uh, people were not prepared to provide the information, help and support. So I actually believe the most important thing that we can do to support health, independence, and quality of life is to get people the right information that they need at the right time. And that is, that is actually a big challenge. Uh, so that has to be done at various levels. Governments need to be able to really be much more, and health service providers need to be much more on the ball. Uh, we need to have trusted information available to people because there's so much rubbish on the internet now. Nobody knows what, what to trust. And then really at the groups, grassroots level, um, I'm doing a lot of work with, again, I mentioned before, community organizations who really um, are some of the most active organizations in Canada to, to provide help and support to people when, when they need it, when they're really struggling with the new things that might be happening as they, as they get older. Absolutely, we should not look at this as, as a fix, but a sea change. Um, Hannah, Sarah, anything? Yeah, I just want to just follow on from what Andrew and, and others have said. Um, I also think when it comes to technology being taught towards healthcare professionals, it needs to go into the curriculum at college and university level right. as part of an ongoing learning process. As an industry player, our responsibility should be to start translating technology into life solution to make that call easier. I mean, we, we need to stop talking about the hardware or the platform itself. We would talk about what it enables in, in, the, in the living space of the individual for both caregivers and care recipients. So the shopability needs to transform as well to support that. So when an OT does graduate and come out and you know does go through the Rolodex of solutions, they know exactly how they are curating um, the solutions in terms of life solutions, not hardware jargon. Yeah, in terms of what is it we need done because the technology will change and technology is moving so quickly. It's crazy to believe that one technology fits all. So at the heart of round two, we're going to be asking the question, you know, what are these challenging times, so to speak, reveal about older adults and technology? And, and I'll add my two cents and then throw it to you. You know, there's a trope out there that old people don't like technology. And most of us don't know what old people are. We usually define it as 15 years older than, than we are to be old people. But I thought the pandemic, actually, if there's a bright spot in it, I think it showed that older adults are a lot more willing to adapt and adopt um, technology as soon as it provides value. You know, the, the idea that I've got an app for this or the story I like to tell and show my own age again, 
I gave my father years ago a Palm Pilot. Anybody remembers that? For those of you who are younger, do a Google and be quiet. But I gave my father a Palm Pilot saying, hey, Dad, you can keep all your contacts in here. You can hold 3,000 uh, uh, introductions and, and whatnot. My father was an engineer. He actually worked on the Apollo program, not afraid of technology. And he pulled out his Moleskine notebook out of his back pocket and he said, son, most of my friends are dead. I only have 14 contacts in here. I don't need a Palm Pilot. And I think the pandemic showed older adults that in certain categories, technology could really provide value. Now it's worth their time, their trouble, and their money. So what have you guys learned? Uh, Hannah, I'll start with you. Yeah, thanks, Joe. Um, so I've been running a couple of COVID projects since last April. Um, one's a, an international project, which includes around 13 sites and 13, 15 languages. And another one is about COVID-19 and the use of dating apps. And that's more UK centric. And from the latter project, what I, you know, what the data, and we're still crunching the numbers and going through the, the interviews, but, you know, we have a widespread of data from the survey ranging from adults in their 20s up to in their 70s who actually do use dating apps. And, you know, they may have used dating apps to, you know, continue conversations. It was mentioned earlier about social connections. Um, and I think, you know, we need to um, get off the merry-go-round of believing that older people and those in their 30s and 40s, you know, they're, they're the future aging populations that they don't use technology because once we get off that narrative, we can start, you know, looking and continue to look at what are the barriers and the challenges and the benefits. And what is it that not only our current aging populations need and require, but also younger generations, because every cohort, if you look at the baby boomers, down to millennials and Gen Zs and even the Gen Xs, they all come with, with their different specifications. Yeah, it's kind of funny that people that we call old today are the ones who laid the groundwork for the space program, the internet, even genome research, but I guess we're still gonna call them old. Sarah, you've got done some really cool stuff at Best Buy with and some other company partners, thoughts? Absolutely. I think, you know, beyond, we're past the point, like, you know, in Best Buy where myth busting the fact that older adults can in fact adopt of course there's going to be a group of older olders or unwell olders where we have to come up with easier solutions for but let's just focus for you know on the ones that i can pick up and adopt and do do great things with it and beyond that i would say that the next thing that we need to talk about when it comes to um, adoption is what helps them improve the quality of their lives, what helps them stay put for as long as possible. Um, and those are the things we got to learn, um, you know, very quickly through through the pandemic um, and understanding what language can be used and explaining those to the older adults, because that's the challenge we run into when it comes to implementing solutions at home is around how do we talk about those solutions and have we helped them understand better what's supposed to go in and get the consent we need to, to go in and implement and, and you know, get them going. So um, I would say, you know, absolutely they're able absolutely they can pick up and use it and like you said there's other generations we're dealing with we brought on fax machines and xerox machines and all that you know great stuff but they're the ones who had hands-on training on these devices that like you said technology is like water we don't have time to pause and teach them how to do things so how do we get them how do we make them easier how do we talk to them in the way that adds value to their lives um, is going to be a big component of, you know, service providers like us, where we have to adopt. Hey, I'm, I'm a big fan of anecdotal uh, stories and technology provide insight. But Andrew, I think you've got some uh, quantitative survey data that you all have developed out of AgeWell. Uh, so old folks, they like technology or, or do we have to help them? Uh, I think uh, the survey that AgeWell did um, really should knock on the head any idea that older people are inherently technophobic. You know, they're, they're, there's this kind of ageist stereotype that if you're old, you're not going to have the interest or the ability or the cognitive capacity to, uh, to use technology or to do, to do new things. And 
Um, th that's definitely an ageist stereotype that we need to um, to um, get knock on the head there. Uh, that I think just looking at my stats here, our, our poll found about 72% of people aged 65 and over feel confident about using current technology. So uh, while there, there are differences, the, the, the great majority of people are confident. I would like to pick up on one word that you used before, Joe, which is value, the value added of something. Um, so I like to listen to records. You know, the old things that you put on a turntable and put a needle into, they're fantastic. I love those. But the greatest thing that has added value to my life in recent years has been online streaming of music, right? Because it's just opened up a huge amount of, um, of opportunity to look at, to listen to, to new music, you know, uh, which was never before. So despite being of an, a bit of an old fogey when it comes to records, I like the new opportunities and that's a huge added value to me. So if people feel and see value, they will adopt things. And that's something that designers and healthcare providers need, really need to figure out that how, how to uh, convey that value to people. I, I think that the kids and our students would call you, a, you're a really cool retro dude, you know, that, that's the way to think about it. No, so, I'm not. <laughs> but, but, you know, I, I think, you know, from a, from a, from a design point of view, uh, uh, and, and when we think about products, I think that many, really well many researchers and designers forget something. We hire products and services to do jobs for us. In many ways, that's the beginning de definition of innovation. But we also buy product or hire products and services and devices for not just what they do for us, what they say about us as well. So a given device is not just what it does, it's whether you're cool or not. And so I'm going to pick on a device that is profoundly rational, profoundly easy to use, has saved, I'm sure, many, many millions of lives over the years, is the personal emergency response uh, system, or Hannah, with respect to my colleagues in the UK, I'll speak English, uh, social alarms, as we like to call them out there. And so in North America, the total penetration of the 65 plus who are frail enough to need these is less than 7%. And some would say, well, Joe, those things are expensive. Okay, fine. Let's say that some adult child out there does not believe their mother or father is worth the price of cable TV per month. Let's go to the UK. The NHS will underwrite the entire price of it. The penetration rate still only goes up to 12%. And generally speaking, it's because very few of us want to wear a device that says, old man walking or old lady about to fall down. So we have to really start rethinking how these technologies are designed into people's lives. Big, beige, and boring that goes buzzing and beeping is no way to live a life. And as I said, it's one third of adult life. So put on your design hats and distribution hats. Any, any comments on, on what we can speak to the researchers and the designers out there to, to get off their duff and come up with something more creative and fun? Hannah, all yours. Yeah, um, so I think really and whether you're targeting younger generations like millennials, Gen X or, or baby boomers and older, you know, from a design standpoint, it has to be co-created, co-designed and tested throughout all the different phases and have that user engagement from the very beginning, right up until deployment and out on the shelves. And, you know, whilst we and, and industry can say, you know, this product works and it's great and it's accessible, you know, we will only really get positive feedback from those users who actually use it. And sorry. I think, that, and sorry, and I think that's what has to really change. You know, we can, we can do projects on, on, you know, short sites and short turnarounds. But to look at the long-term impact, it has this, the notion has to change. And yeah. Mm -hmm. Sarah, I know Best Buy does some uh, consumer research in your stores and out of your stores. Any thoughts on how this mm -hmm. might imp impact that? Oh, for sure. Uh, in, so everything you said is true in our world as well, Joe. It's 
where independent is considered unsexy, undateable, all, all that, all that um, feedback that we receive. And through our amazing research partners, SAM3 at Carlton Burier, we also learning that not all wearable fall pendants work the same for older adults. You know, they, the degree and the speed they do fall is not always, you know, um, identified by, let's say, our, our great Apple Watch, for example. So what we're chasing in Best Buy Canada is a non-wearable solution. You know, if, if it can get in the space. Yes. And through technology, we can we can go ahead and understand the positioning of the individual in the in the room. And I'm sure a whole bunch of us seen a whole bunch of solutions. But I feel really good about one we have identified, or hopefully we can talk about soon. Non-wearable in our world, I think, is the next phase of where we have to go after, where the individual just has to live in this space for as long as in homes concerned, and then of course the solution where they leave the home. Um, and so, yeah, we're, we're kind of getting over the purse um, ideas as much as possible. Yeah, please make sure we, we come back to that because I think it's incredi incredibly important that we don't all think about wearing stuff. I guess so the other thing I'd, I'd want to throw in there, and, and Andrew, and you're both your research as well as work at, at AgeWell, I've been very frustrated in many cases by my own team and some of my amazing students that I get to work with, that anytime they think of a new technology for older adults, they do think of things that are needed. Walkers, wheelchairs, GPS guided, this or that. And as I said, I've seen more pill reminder systems in the last quarter of century than I care to, to count as a master's thesis. Uh, but, you know, we never think about technology. I'm going to look both ways. It's just between the four of us. The F word fun. Has anyone been developing work uh, technology out there that's part of this thing called age tech that keeps people connected for the fun of it? Not just because, hey, mom, did you take your pills? Okay, thanks. Hang up the phone. Andrew, have you seen anybody out there having fun or uh, what's going on? I'll put my hand up and say that I've done such, uh, such related work. Um, it actually, when you... With students or, or people working in this sector, you're dead right, Joe, that the, the focus is always on problems. And it's, it's never on, well, what do we want to uh, do in life? The answers you get are always dependent on the questions that you ask. That's a, the, the number one issue in, re in research. If you ask the wrong questions, you'll get the wrong results out at the end. So a project that I did a, a few years ago was uh, we, we, we asked people, well, what do you like to do? What are the things that you want to do? What contributes to your quality of life? Um, and again, going back to the thing I mentioned about music, the number one thing that came up for people with dementia was that we actually like to listen to music or participate in music related things. So we developed a uh, music player that was um, as normal looking as possible, but usable by people with quite significant uh, cognitive impairments. And uh, that's available from the shops. You can go and buy that. So uh, we can do a lot more uh, to, to, to do that um, kind of more normal kind of technology, as well as the more health related things as well. Great. Hannah, I believe you've got something interesting to say. Please go for it. Thanks, Joe. Um, I want to just kind of throw a curveball out. And whilst we're talking about age tech now, kind of think, you know, what about the future? What's going to happen in 40, 50, 60 years time? And, you know, are we actually going to have devices? You know, we probably won't have wearable devices, but what about chips and tattoos? And by chips, I mean the implantable chips yeah. into our bodies. And, you know, I do think if we also take an alternative exploration to the future maybe and i know there's work being done at the moment with implantables and tattoos and stuff like that but i think we we also need to think about the future what will babies being born today what will they be using when they're 60 and 70 and those that are not even born yet and i'd just like to share a little blog piece in the chat for everybody you know, think about the fact that, and we're going to move on to round three here in a moment, uh, but think about the fact that in the so-called industrialized world, 
50% of the children born today will make it past 100 years old. So think about what will that child be doing, shall we say, in the year 20, you know, uh, 2120? Uh, will they be wearing what's around them and the like? Um, so let's move on to round three and keep this going. I want to keep the chat going as well. We will get to uh, have a few minutes for questions as well. So the next one question is, how will age tech impact care across all settings? Um, and is it supportive aging in place and the like? Uh, share some thoughts on the role you think that uh, age tech will play in the comprehensive lives of older adults. By the way, Hannah, I did you a disservice because of the F word around fun. You have done work around dating apps. So I guess that that probably would uh, count on that as well. But let's let's talk about that. What uh, what do we see in terms of the role, various roles technology is going to play? Sadly, we just finished a study at the Age Lab in partnership with Bank of America. And we found that technology was really doing great things, again, for the medicine side of things uh, and medications, hypertension management, uh, you know, asthma management, COPD and the like. But when it came to other things like maintaining the house, cleaning the house, making a meal, uh, have delivered or preparing a meal, um, it seems like the, the whiz kids and technology are not there yet. It's still going to be very high touch rather than high tech. So on that note, I'll throw it to you. Who would like to jump in first? I can take a stab at that. Yeah. Um, and in, in terms of, I mean, there are different you know, phrases that can be used in, in, in um, describing aging in place. And we call it independent living to try to reduce dependence as much as possible and then improve that quality of relationships as much as possible. And the one technology we continue to see um, being underrated, it is wellness monitoring, that concept of helpful home uh, that can not only uh, help the unpaid caregivers, we got 8 million of them across Canada, these are the, the sons and daughters and the friends of the family who are actually chipping in and helping, uh, but also helping the in, you know, formal caregivers to know you know, what, what the baseline looks like, what, what the deviation from the baseline looks like and be able to act in time as opposed to wait till the incident happens or wait for the health, you know, um, incident, the currents take place before they start reacting. So to me, like, you know, a, a monitoring is the wrong word, but I'm call, calling it what it is. It is an underrated technology. Um, it is pretty much something that Scandin Scandinavian countries have picked up, but very new to Canada, merely because the way we talk about it to care recipients and we freak them out, you know, when, when the word comes out. Um, and it is something that, you know, AgeWell has created a great pla platform for us to be able to validate. So, you know, through AgeWell, we were, we had success in great finding amazing partners, um, Sam three out of Carlton and Briere. So where we can go through study the, you know, the efficacy and the ethics aspect of our wellness monitoring solution in Canada, in Best Buy Canada. Um, and, and, and I think that's something that's missing from the future flavor. You know, nobody's talking about the safety features. Nobody's talking about um, at this point, what is my mom's baseline? Uh, how can I have more informed conversation? How do I call and not ask about their bathroom usage frequency? Like how do we even improve that? the fun aspect of the conversation. So um, that is something that, you know, um, you know, AgeWell has provided to us access to be able to validate such technology before it goes in. And then for us to start seeing the evidence, are we adding value? Are we in fact improving the quality of independence or level of independence and quality of life? Um, so I think that's definitely a topic I'm always interested to talk about and be able to also provide healthcare a remote way of, you know, feeling where human body cannot show up at home overnight. You know, these are some of the, some of the things that we haven't really discussed, you know, in a more deeper level, but the great news is technology is available and can in fact be implemented. Great. Hannah, would you like to add to that? Yeah, thanks. I agree with everything that Sarah said and with aging in place, you know, I'm familiar with Andrew's work and, and I've written about it more recently and, and I want to take a different perspective and suggest, you know, organizations such as the World Health Organization, who have their, you know, aging place framework from published in 2007, you know, that framework didn't include technology. Did it, it, although it has ICT, one can argue, which I have done, 
and uh, you know they, there's more newer innovative models out now which are available to download but i think you know, if we look at it from within the home, the community, and across different levels of our communities and society, we can build on how aging and place could be now, 10 years and 60 years from now on. And I think, you know, that allows industry as well as stakeholders, educators, health practitioners, all these different ecosystems coming together and playing their respective uh, roles at various times and at different times within that ecosystem. Thank you. Yeah. Andrew, your thoughts as you're, you're listening to your uh, LPs, would you like your smart toilet to be checking in on you? Uh, I don't know about that, Joe, but um, <laughs> so just to pick up on the, what, what Hannah's just mentioned uh, and, and highlight that it is the uh, United Nations WHO decade of healthy, um, healthy aging um 2021 20, to 30 and we should use that idea of healthy aging is that we shouldn't see aging as a time of um independent of dependence and frailty and try to move towards uh, a, a much more positive agenda well what can we get out of these extra years that we now have in life so so that's something that we we we've really got to uh, address and this is this is going to be a multi-sectoral thing in, in many ways, you know, we've seen from our survey that we've done is that many older people and technology, fine, it's taking care of itself. But what I really think that we need to do is um, in the healthcare sector, for example, is to create a healthcare sector that is actually fit for the digital age, right? Uh, our healthcare system, particularly in relation to older people, was designed probably 150 years ago, right, and has barely changed since. It, it, it beggars belief um, sometimes when you think about that. Um, as an organization, AgeWell is working really hard to put, not just push the, the technology agenda, but the agenda for innovation more generally, that what we have to do at a governmental level uh, within the commercial sector, uh, within the healthcare providers to push this agenda of innovation that is going to contribute to, um, to a more healthy uh, life as we, as we age. And, it, you, you know, we've, um, we've got to look at issues around acceptability, around access to technology, around training for people within the healthcare sector for example, and seeing it as a, as, as a multi-sector thing that we've got to work on. Great. Boy, you know, with great panelists, it goes really fast. Let's try to turn to the questions that we have uh, from the audience out there. And I think one of the really good questions, which kind of keeps the whole flow going for our, our, uh, event, our discussion here is the pandemic, we hope, is going to be over soon, if uh, not sooner. What does it mean for aging and technology once the pandemic is over? Any thoughts? Let's do a lightning round on answering that question for one of our audience members. Uh, I'll, I'm going to take a stab at that. I, I think if we lose the momentum, um, I, I believe Canada had the best year of in terms of innovation or disruptive way of implementing services over the past couple of years. So, as a whole, each one of us, if you lose momentum, shame on us. That's, you know, that this is exactly, you know, the pandemic happened for a right reasons in this, in this um, conversation on this topic. So I think, you know, one of the things that we can um, expect and have been receiving from AgeWell is creating such, such collaborations that we continue looking at, not just the, as I said, the hardware and platform itself, but the life solutions designed produced by such technologies, as well as, you know, hopefully some job aids for family caregivers and how to talk about them as they're wanting their care recipients to adopt, because that's, I think, is a missing pillar as a whole. And then, um, and then the future is now, like we should maybe start using so much of a future in our terminology. Let's look, go after low hanging fruits and then hopefully come up with things that we can get rolling um, in the midst or post pandemic. So let's not lose the momentum. Let's keep going at it at the same fuel. That's a great answer and a great way to conclude some of the remarks. Hannah, what do you think? 
I think um, I think there needs to be multiple changes across all levels of ecosystems. Um, from a healthcare perspective, I think, um, as I've said before, education has to start in college and universities um, and additional training for those who are already in practice. Um, and to keep in mind, you know, there are people, whether they're older or younger, who are on fixed incomes. And that affordability of a device or having broadband into your home is just not viable for some people because food and heating is more important. And that's that sometimes that narrative gets lost and you know governments don't want to acknowledge that there are people on the poverty line. So um, I would like to see in a post-pandemic society more, more opportunities to hear those voices that aren't always heard and for real change within the grassroots communities. That's great. I'm hearing momentum is a theme from Sarah. I'm hearing access from Hannah. Andrew, would you like to bring us home? What do you think? Uh, yeah, just going back to that word momentum is, and, and disruption uh, is, is that um, the pandemic has forced us in change things in, in many ways. Uh, and it's also highlighted some of the, the, the problems and fissures that exist within society. For example, uh, we're, we've all become very, just very, very aware of the inadequacies of long-term residential care in all our communities, whether that's in Canada or the UK or, or, or whatever. So, so that's forcing our hand to, to have a look at that. And we, we really need to figure out new ways of, of providing that kind of care. And hopefully the pandemic will lead us to do that. Technology is going, isn't going to answer all those questions, obviously, but it's part of the answer. So we've got to think about, about that. There are also other areas. So for example, the use of um, just basic telehealth has been around for many, many years, um, but we've just not made use of that. Um, not everybody likes it. It's not going to work for everybody, but for many people, yeah, it's, a, it's an easier way of, um, of, uh, of accessing health services. And for example, in the UK, they've really got some very, very good models for, um, uh, you know, getting access to, um, to um, uh, healthcare advice very quickly, uh, for example, which, you know, and, and this is what technology can afford. I think that I could not ask the panel to do a better summary while asking answering a question from one of our audience members. I guess I would say I agree with all three of you. I would just add one more thing is that the story of old age needs to be rewritten. We're not going to band-aid over uh, anything with new technology or new service. We need to really imagine the oldest technology in the world is not a device, not a chip. It's the story. So let's write a new story for that one third of adult life, the aspirations, the motivations, the meaning, our sense of purpose, the things we can do, not the things we can't. And then we'll find the technologies to make that happen. So on that note, I wanna thank my panel for being great, my audience for being great, and AgeWell for being the brilliant shining light in Canada and throughout the world. In closing, I wanted to ask everyone to know that the next panel, Emerging Leaders, uh, uh, on emerging technologies. And the webinar link for the session is available now in the WOVA platform. And you can join it directly by a uh, link that's being provided now in the chat box. Thank you, Agewell. Thanks, panel. Let's all age well. Take care. <laughs>